But we're continuing our series today, What Is? Where we're answering basic questions of the faith, like what is faith? What is salvation? What is tithing? What is baptism? What is prayer? And today's message, appropriately, since we're celebrating the Lord's Supper, is what is the Lord's Supper? Now remember our friend Sally, she's the young girl who always seemed to be full of questions. And in fact, it's partially due to Sally that we're on this series because she had all these questions that we have already answered. Well, one morning, Sally's family got to church a little bit early. She goes in a little bit early because her mother had agreed to help prepare for the Lord's Supper that morning. And so Sally went into the room where the folks were preparing and she observed as their little squeeze bottle of juice was squeezed into little tiny cups. And Sally was wondering, how come so little? That doesn't seem like a lot. And so Sally observed and then there was another gold platter that was brought out and there were some crackers that were broken up. And there was some talking and the discussion with the people that were preparing like that well probably the pastor forgot to order the communion wafers and so we have to take these saltines and break them up and make it work today as sally's mom and the other folks were setting up they were talking about jesus and his love and his faithfulness and as sally observed there was some laughter and there were some tears then they took the elements out into the sanctuary and they put them on a table in the rear of the sanctuary, and they put them on a table in the front of the sanctuary. There were some nice linens on there, and inscribed on the front of the table, Sally had just, was just learning how to read. She sounded it out. It said, do this in uh, re remembrance of me. And Sally wondered, what in the world does this do this in remembrance of me mean? Sally's mom said, I think it's going to be a great day here at church. We're going to have a wonderful Lord's Supper. And Sally couldn't contain herself anymore. And she said, Mom, what is the Lord's Supper? Sally's mom said, the Lord's Supper is a special way that we remember what Jesus did for us. Now, Sally's mom had a pretty good answer. The Lord's Supper is a special way that we remember what Jesus did for us. But Sally, you know, she's a very inquisitive girl. So that brought some other questions cascading in her mind like, if it's really supper, why are the portions so small? It looks more like a snack. She was kind of confused. Uh, what exactly are we supposed to remember? And what exactly did Jesus do for us? Is there a certain way? Is this the only way to do this Lord's Supper thing? And why do some people come and take the Lord's Supper and others don't? Sally was confused. And what if you don't know if Jesus has done anything for you? And then Sally tried to remember back to the last time that she saw the church do the Lord's Supper, and she remembered some soft music playing and some people bowing their heads, and they seemed to be thinking or praying, or maybe they were just tired because the service had gone on so long. Sally didn't know. And if they were thinking, what were they thinking about? And if they were praying, Sally wondered, well, what were they praying about? Those are all great questions that Sally had, and we're going to attempt to answer all of those questions as we go through the message today. And here's how we're going to proceed. We're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. We're going to pray again. Then we're going to answer the question, what is the Lord's Supper? And then we will end our service with the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he gives a succinct, short, clear, concise description of what the Lord's Supper is. The scriptures say, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord, as we study this Lord's Supper, this gift that you have given us, God, help us to understand it just a little bit better today. And Lord, help us to celebrate 
in an appropriate way this amazing gift that you've given to your church. We love you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. The passage that we read is just a short description written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. It would have been a couple decades after the first, the first Lord's Supper that Jesus instituted. And I want us to look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 11 and kind of compare it to that first Lord's Supper where Jesus changed the meaning of the Passover. It's recorded for us in all the Gospels, but specifically we're going to be looking at the account in Matthew chapter 26. And so to set the scene for Matthew chapter 26, Jesus and his disciples, they're in Jerusalem. They're there to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also called Passover. It was a feast, it was a festival, it was a celebration that the nation of Israel had kept for a thousand years. Every year, the nation of Israel commemorated, they celebrated, they remembered the mighty and wondrous acts that God had done to bring them from slavery to freedom, to bring them out of the bondage of the Pharaoh in Egypt. God had instructed his people on that first Passover, nearly a thousand years before Jesus and his disciple gathered for this meal. He had instructed them to sacrifice a lamb, a lamb without spot or blemish. And to take some of the blood from the lamb and put it on the doorpost and threshold of their house. Because God said that judgment was coming. But that when judgment came, when the Lord's judgment came, if the destroyer, when he came, if there was blood on the threshold and the doorpost of the house, then the Lord would pass over that house and they would be spared from judgment. Everyone who embraced God's means for being spared from judgment, would have that opportunity. And so the destroyer did come, and the people that had embraced God's means of salvation indeed were spared, and they were passed over. The ones that didn't suffered judgment. And this was the final straw to a stubborn Pharaoh to let God's people go. There's so much more to this story, but for our purposes, it's just a little bit of background telling us that the nation of Israel thought this was a big deal that they commemorated this for a thousand years. Think about that. The country that we live in, America, is only about 250 years old. Our country would have to go on for four times the amount that it even existed for us to be celebrating like the 4th of July for a thousand years. They had celebrated for a thousand years to remember what God had done for them. And today... As we look at how Jesus changed the meaning of the Passover meal into what we call the Lord's Supper, I want us to note the four things. What is the Lord's Supper? It is a time to prepare. It is a time to prepare. There's our first point for today. Look at Matthew chapter 26 in verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? For Jesus' disciples, it was a given that the Passover meal was going to happen. And it was also a given that there needed to be some preparation to take place. So their question was not do we prepare, it's where do we prepare? We've got to get ready. Verse 18, he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. Boy, there's a sermon right there, right? The disciples did as Jesus directed them. And they prepared the Passover. The Lord's Supper is a time to prepare. The disciples knew that there needed to be some preparation done. They had the Passover meal circled on the calendar. Nothing else was scheduled on that day. It was a priority. It was a rhythm of life for them. It was a rhythm of the life for them individually, familiarly, and with their nation. For here, for us at Sheridan Woods Church, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's on a rhythmic basis on the first Sunday of every month. Is it circled on your calendar? Is it part of the rhythm of your spiritual life? Do you look forward to it? Have you prepared for it? 
on the first Sunday of every month. They say that Sunday church is a Saturday night decision, and I believe that's even more so true of the first Sundays of the month where we celebrate the Lord's Supper. The question is, are we well-rested? Are we anticipatory? Are we unhurried? Are we looking forward to the time with our church family where we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together? And not only should we be prepared from a scheduling standpoint, we should be prepared from a church family standpoint standpoint. And to be clear, whatever is necessary to maintain the health of this body, the relationships within the church family, is preparation for the Lord's Supper. Because we celebrate the Lord's Supper as a family. And if we're not taking care of the family, if we're not participating in the life and the ministry and the heartbeat of the church, if we have broken relationships within the church, then we haven't done the prep work necessary to be ready for the Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul was trying to help the church at Corinth understand this. And so he called out their dysfunction. He called out their selfishness. He called out their disunity. And he said, guys, you're, you're not ready to take the Lord's Supper. You're not ready to celebrate that as a family because you haven't prepared. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 22. He'd been commending them for doing something right, but then look at what he says in verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for better, but for the worse. He's saying, listen, guys, when you come together for this purpose, and it's going to be the Lord's Supper, it's not for good, it's, it's for worse. So what, why does is, why is Paul think this? Verse 18, he says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. There's disunity. There's people that are divided against each other. There's cliques and factions. You're not operating as a church family. And he says, and I, I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. Paul says there, there's division. You're not unified. And that's a problem. Verse 20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. It's clear that the church at Corinth thought they were doing the Lord's Supper. That they had the juice and the crackers ready. And they were going to do the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, in your condition, that's not really the Lord's Supper. Because you have not prepared. Verse 21. <clears throat> for in eating, talking about eating what they thought was the Lord's Supper, for in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal, just thinking about themselves. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. Paul's just calling it like it is. He's saying you guys come together for the Lord's Supper. Some of you guys are getting drunk. Some of you guys are... <clears throat> Excuse me, you're taking, uh, taking your own plate and not worried about if someone else is going to get some? There was a lot of dysfunction and selfishness going on. Verse 22, he says, What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Aren't you preparing for the Lord's Supper? Or do you despise the church of God? There's some strong words. Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Paul says, Guys, Church of Corinth, you're not ready to take the Lord's Supper. There are divisions, there's disunity, there's selfishness. You're not taking care of one another. Some of you have a lot and some of you have a little. And you're not like, taking care of one another. So preparing for the Lord's Supper, it includes prioritizing the date. And it also includes taking care of the church family. It also includes addressing any disunity or broken relationships that you may have within your church family. So what is the Lord's Supper? It's a time to prepare. It's also a time to ponder. A time to ponder. Look at verse 20. Matthew 26. When it was evening, Jesus reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. That must have stopped the conversation right there. One of you will betray me. Verse 22. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after the other, one after the other, all of them saying this to Jesus, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Jesus is having the Passover meal with his disciples, and he says, one of you guys, you're not really my follower. You got the cross. You end your Instagram post with hashtag blessed. You got the Sharon Woods Church t-shirt. 
You got it all going on. You're playing the Christian game. You know the Christianese language to say, but you're not genuine. It's all a show and it's not real. Jesus said, and your true colors are going to come out. And so Jesus' followers begin to wonder. They begin to ponder. They begin to think. They begin to reflect. They begin to examine their relationship with Jesus. And whether it was authentic, and whether the relationship with Jesus in their heart matched up with what they said with their mouth. Verse 23, Jesus answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written. The Son of Man goes as it is written. It was a foreordained that Christ would go to the cross for us. So he was going no matter what. It was the plan of God. But then listen to this next phrase, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Jesus is saying that in authentic being in relationship with him, in an authentic and genuine way, is crucial. Because just playing the Christian game, Jesus says it would have been better for that man if he hadn't been born. Verse 25, Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. So how, did this, how does this apply to us? The Lord's Supper is a time to ponder. Is it a time to think? Is it a time to reflect upon our relationship with the Lord? It's time to examine your walk with Christ. It's time to see if your walk matches your talk. It's a time to be honest with yourself, and about yourself. If there's sin in your life, it's a time to recognize it and to, to be honest about it. Verse, 1 Corinthians 11, 29, 27 through 29. Look at what the Apostle Paul says. He says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. In an unworthy manner. So what is the unworthy manner? Look at verse 28. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So what is an unworthy manner of taking the Lord's Supper? It's have not examined yourself. Have not taken the time to think about your relationship, to ponder your relationship. To examine yourself. What is the Lord's Supper? It's a time to prepare. It's a time to ponder. It's also a time to pray. A time to pray. Verses 26 through 28. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And this is where Jesus takes a thousand-year-old tradition, a thousand-year-old meal, and he gives it a new meaning. He took the bread, and after blessing it, which means he prayed, after blessing it, after prayer, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Verse 27. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, or when he had prayed, when he had blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for forgiveness of sins. That's what Jesus was teaching his disciples. This was before the cross, so in real time, they didn't know exactly what this meant. When Jesus said, this bread is my body and this wine is my blood. But through the prism of the cross, it was crystal clear what Jesus had meant. He had taken this thousand-year-old tradition and injected new meaning into it and said, this blood is the blood of the new covenant. There's a new thing that I'm doing. I'm fulfilling all the promises of the Old Testament. I am the fulfillment of them. I am the Messiah and the Anointed One. And how you're going to remember it is by the bread, which represents my body, and the juice or the wine, which represents my blood. And the point I'm trying to make here about prayer is, is that Jesus prayed before he gave them the bread. And he prayed before he gave them the wine. And this importance of prayer is carried over decades later in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 24 and 25. It says... And when Jesus had given thanks or he prayed, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup in the same way after praying. 
So it's a time to pray. So we've prepared, we've pondered, and now it's time to pray. And what should we be praying about? How should we be praying? Well, it says that he gave thanks. Jesus modeled for us that we should be praying with a thankful heart, with an attitude of gratitude. We should thank the Lord for his unimaginable, gracious, merciful, spotless, perfect sacrifice on the cross. Thank you, Lord. We should thank him for the forgiveness of sins that his blood spilled out, his perfect blood procured for all who would call upon his name. Thank you, Lord. We should be thanking him for the opportunity just to call him, Lord. We should be thank you, thanking him for choosing us, for loving us, for while we were still sinners, God showed his love in that Christ died on the cross. You should be thanking God for not giving up on you. You should be thanking God for second chances. Everybody in here has had to have a second chance, huh? You should be thanking God that he loved us. And that when we mess up, and we repent of our sin, he forgives us and cleanses us. And gives you the strength and the power to go on. Now I could go on and on about all the things that we have to be thankful for and that we should be thanking the Lord for. One thing that we should be thanking for is, is that we'll have all eternity to thank him for. We can thank him that he's going to prepare a place for us, a place where we spend all of eternity. And for all of eternity, we'll be learning more and more about the depth and the beauty of his love and his grace and his mercy. And we'll have all of eternity to say, thanks, Jesus. And it'll never get old. And so we can practice that a little bit here on earth by just praying and thanking the Lord. Not only should we be thanking him, we should also, in our prayers, we should be confessing any sin. Because remember, we're supposed to examine ourselves. And if there is any division, is there any broken relationships? Is there any selfishness in your life? Or the, some of the things that the Apostle Paul called out? If there's those things that are present in your life that don't look like Jesus, then the Lord's Supper is a time to pray about those. Not only ponder and think and recognize, but to pray and confess and get that right. And rest in the Lord's forgiveness and cleansing. So we pray. What is the Lord's Supper? It's a time to prepare. It's a, it's a time to ponder. It's a, it's a time to pray. But it's also a time to proclaim. A time to proclaim. Closing out the first account, the account of the first Lord's Supper, Jesus alludes to his return. To the fact that he's not going to celebrate this meal with his followers until the fullness of his kingdom has arrived. Not until the he returns the second coming of Christ. Look at verse 29. Jesus says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, but we also, when we take the Lord's Supper, we proclaim our belief that the Lord is coming. Look again at what the scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we do the Lord's Supper, we're proclaiming. We're proclaiming the Lord's death on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, and all that accomplished on the cross. We're also proclaiming that we believe as his church that he's coming again. And when we gather around the Lord's table, it's a proclamation. It's, it's a testimony, it's a bearing witness, it's a declaration, it's we're stating, we're asserting, we're affirming Jesus that yes, he is all that he said he was and that he's coming again. We proclaim his death and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension and his coming again. We also proclaim, when we come and take the elements, we proclaim that we have examined ourselves and that we're not doing this lightly. And then we have taken the time to make sure that we're not rushing and 
just doing a religious ritual in an unworthy manner. We're proclaiming when we, when you come up and you grab a little piece of cracker and a cup of juice, you're proclaiming that you have pondered your relationship with Christ. You're proclaiming that you have taken the time to pray and talk with the Lord about whatever you need to talk with Him about. It's a public proclamation. It's a public declaration that you belong to Jesus. So when you come and grab the elements, it's a testimony to everybody in the room. You're saying, I belong to to Jesus. That Jesus is my King. That Jesus is my Lord. That Jesus is my Master. That Jesus is my Savior. Quite frankly, that Jesus is my everything. That's what you're proclaiming when you walk out from the pew and you come up here and you grab the elements. It's a public proclamation. It is a testimony, it is a witness to everybody who can see that you belong to Jesus. So what is the Lord's Supper? It's a time to prepare. It's a time to ponder. It's a time to pray and it's a time to proclaim. And so we're going to do that just now. We're going to participate in the Lord's Supper as a faith family, as a church family, where we celebrate the life, death, burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so first, what I want us to do is just to ponder. Would you just take a moment right there in your seat to ponder, to think about, to reflect on your relationship with Jesus. Holy Spirit, speak to us. I want you to take just a moment to pray. As you've thought and reflected and examined your relationship with Christ and whatever else that the Holy Spirit brought to your mind, would you talk to the Lord about that? If there's sin to confess, now would be a great time to do that. If there's something that the Lord has brought to mind that he's calling you to do, now would be a good time to say, yes, Lord. If the Lord has brought to your mind a broken relationship, that he's calling you to take the first step in making that right, Now would be a good time to tell him, yes, Lord. And just take the next moment and just thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for the infinite number of blessings that he has given you. First and foremost, your salvation. Take a moment to say thank you, Lord, how he's been there for you in the good times and the bad.
moment to thank the Lord that as a child of God, there is a promise of a glorious eternity with Him. you all stand please and in just a moment I'm going to ask you to come up and get the elements to get a cup of juice and a piece of the bread and when you come up I'll direct you when to do that when you come up I just want you to go back and seated and continue just a period of reflection and prayer and pondering and thanking the Lord but I do want to be really clear about this that you don't have to be a member of Sharon Woods Church to partake in the Lord's Supper. But you do have to be a member of God's family. Because remember, when you're coming forward, you are publicly proclaiming that I belong to Jesus. That there has been a point in time in your life where you have said, I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. I follow you, Lord Jesus. And if that's not you, that's okay. We're glad that you are here. Everybody's at a different place on their spiritual journey. Thank you so much for joining us today. But if that's not you, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then don't feel any pressure just to participate or follow along the crowd. In fact, I would just appreciate it if you didn't. And if you have more questions about following Jesus, then you can just come see me after service. I would love for you to talk about that with me. So with that being said, come up and grab the elements or tables in the front or the back and then return to your seats, and then we'll take them, take the elements all together. may be seated. The bread represents Jesus' body that was
broken for us. Lord, we thank you for your broken body. We, we just say thank you, Jesus. Lord, words could not describe our gratitude and really just our shock and awe of what you have done for us. So thank you, Lord. We love you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. The scriptures say that he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance, and let's eat together. juice represents Jesus' precious blood that was spilled for us. Such grace and such love, such undeserved mercy. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you thankful that you made a way for us to be forgiven and cleansed. Lord, your word says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So, Lord, we thank you for your precious blood that was spilled for us. We thank you, Lord. We proclaim that we belong to you. We proclaim that we are your followers. And that, Lord Jesus, you are everything. We love you, Lord. It's in your wonderful name that we pray. Amen. The scriptures say, and likewise the cup, after they had eaten, Jesus said, this cup is poured out for you. It's the new covenant in my blood. Let's drink together. Amen.